hello and welcome to Thrive Church. Whether you are here with us in person or online, we welcome you. We are so honored to have you here with us. I'm Judah, lead pastor at Thrive Church, and we are in our series, Battle Ready. Battle Ready. You know, we are in a battle in this world, and there's an enemy who is coming to attack you. Scripture says that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour you, and he's throwing darts and he's shooting arrows at you trying to stop you and distract you, and, and he's attacking you in many ways. This, this past week has been a, been a crazy week for, for many people. So many people have been without power here in our state. And, and, and in my family, we were out without power, but not that long. But we had houses in our neighborhood that, that got destroyed from trees coming down. And, and this just it seems like everything uh, this year that could go wrong goes wrong. We are under some attacks. Uh, personally, we're under attacks. You know, uh, politically, all these things, it seems like they're going on in this world. But there is a war that is even more real than these things that we see. And this is a battle over you. It's a battle over your mind. It's a battle over your soul. And our enemy, the devil, is coming at you trying to stop you. He's throwing, throwing darts at you trying to stop you. And it says here... In Ephesians 6.13, it says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God. We've been in the series for a couple weeks now talking about the full armor of God and what exactly that means. It's just so that when the day of evil comes, and many of you have had some evil days recently, you've had some difficult times, maybe even outside of everything that's been attacking us collectively, maybe you've gone through some relationship problems, some financial problems. He says, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We talked about the belt of truth in the first week and, and how this is foundational to our walk with Christ. This is foundational to the armor. This is not offensive. It's not defensive. It's foundational. Every piece of the armor hangs on this belt of truth, the truth of God's word. So with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate of, of right living, being in right standing with God. Not something that we uh, uh, earn, but something that God offers to us freely. The breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We spoke of this last week, about having the shoes of peace on our feet, being anchored so that we can stand firm when the attacks come. We can stand strong in God's peace that passes all understanding. In addition to all this, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We, we have some armor here. And, and this is a replica of what Paul would see each and every day as he'd see Roman uh, soldiers, Roman prison guards. As he was in prison, he would see them and he would know that, that they would put this armor on each and every day before they would go into battle. And us as followers of Jesus Christ, in much the same way, we need to go into this life with protection on. We need to go with the, the, the sword of the spirit and the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth the shoes of peace, and the shield of faith. The shield of faith. The, the shield is what we're talking about this week. The shield of faith. You know, the Romans were innovators, and they were pioneers. You know, the, the previous shields that, that many Roman soldiers had were small, they were round, and, and, and they left a lot of the soldier unprotected, quite honestly. And, and they said, something's got to be done about this. We, we need better shields. So they came up with a shield that looked a lot like this. Now, this was a lot bigger shield, but they were still reasonably lightweight. But it was a bigger shield, and, and the soldiers could take these into battle. You know the great thing about a shield this big was? Was that they could put it on the ground, and, and the soldier could literally hide behind it. They could get down, the, they, they could be under attack, and they could duck behind it. Arrows are coming, they get behind this thing. They, they could just be behind this, maybe their head would be sticking up, but they had their helmet protecting them, and they would be pretty much protected from any attack. This was a shield that they could use for all kinds of things. This was a, an innovative shield. But not only could the shield be used to protect them, but see, the shield could also be used 
to advance into battle. A lot of times when we think of a shield, we think simply of, of protecting ourselves, but they could use it as a way to advance. See, see these shields were, were shaped in such a way that, that if a group of soldiers was marching into battle and they were coming under attack, specifically attack from the air, the fiery darts, the flaming arrows that were coming at them, they, they had a formation. It was called testudo. Testudo was the Latin word, and it literally meant a tortoise, and it was this tortoise maneuver, and what it would do was they would link their shields together, shield to shield, shield to shield, all the way down the line, and then the guys behind them would put the shields over top. You can see a picture right here of what the soldiers would do, and the arrows would come flying at them, and all of them would be holding up their shields, and they'd hold it above their heads, and they would be protected from the attacks of the enemy. All the arrows would fly, and the soldiers would protect themselves. They'd take a step forward. They'd block the attack. They'd take a step forward. It prevented these attacks from the enemy. In your notes, faith is strong, but shared faith is stronger. It's important to have a shared faith. See, see, they had their shield of faith, their shield which protected them, but a shared faith is much stronger. See, see, you have to have community to have testudo. You had to have more than one soldier. And when they were in that formation, they were virtually impenetrable in those days. They could move forward against an attacking army with little to no casualty because they were protected in the front and above and even on the sides if necessary. So they were protected by their shield. The shield of faith is what we're thinking about. Normally we think of the shield as simply, simply defensive, but, but in the middle of the shield was this, this metal piece. Now the great thing about this metal piece was that not only could the shield be used to protect them, they would actually punch with it. Like they would go up to someone and punch them with, with, this, with this knob sticking out the front. The, the shield was actually not only a protective defensive device, but it was offensive as well. So Paul says, take the shield of faith. So what is faith? Faith is a belief in something. I'm sure there's things that, that you believe in, but, but more specifically than just a faith, this is an, an active faith. A faith that actually has actions associated with it. This is an active faith, not a stagnant faith, not simply believing in something, not just a belief, but actions that follow the belief. I, I, could, I could believe in the effectiveness of the shield, but if I don't bring it into battle with me, what good would it be? If it's not an active faith, if, if I go into battle but I leave my shield behind, oh, I have, I have faith, I have a shield, but if I'm not actively using it, what good is it? It has no purpose at all. So we need to have faith as a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, in, in Hebrews 11:6, it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Did you know that? Did you know it is, it's not improbable, it's not unlikely to please God, it's not like maybe you'll please God if you don't have faith. Here it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. If you don't have faith, you have no chance, no hope of pleasing God. It says anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Are you trying to, to please God? Maybe you're trying to please God with your actions, how, the things that you do, maybe by your generosity, by, by, by being kind to strangers. If you're trying to please God, but you have no faith in him, it is impossible to please him. We say, well, look at all the good things that I've done. Well, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm not as bad as him. I'm not as bad as her. Scripture says it is impossible to please God without faith. You can't please God on your works alone. Do you know it's also impossible to live life without faith? It's impossible to live life without faith of some sort. Some people say, well, I don't have any faith at all. I don't, I'm not a person of faith. It is impossible to live your life without faith. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter uh, you know, what you say you believe or what you don't believe. It is impossible to live a life without faith faith in your notes if you're taking them we all have faith in something we all have faith in something he said well no i don't because i'm an atheist i'm an atheist i don't i don't believe in god i don't believe in any of that stuff so my question to you is you have faith in nothing 
You, you have faith in nothing? You have, you say, I, you know, you have no evidence that God doesn't exist, first off. Like, like, you don't have any evidence that there isn't a God. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary. There's evidence of the fact that there's an architect in this world. Like, we, we don't go up and see a building and just assume that, that it just happened to be there. We, we, we have the assumption there was an architect and a builder, even though you don't know who they are. You'll never meet them. You don't know where they're from. You don't know anything about them. But you see a building, and the immediate assumption is that there was an architect, a designer, and a builder. When we look at this world around us and the complexity of the world that we live in, from, from, from microorganisms to leaves to, to the human brain, to the universe, I, it's, it's evidence that there probably is something else out there. There's an architect. See, you have to have a lot of faith to believe that your assumption is true. You have to have a lot of faith to, to believe the assumption that there is no God. See, that, that takes faith. It takes faith to say, nope, there is no God. In spite of all the evidence around me, I'm still choosing to have faith that there is not a God. See, being an atheist takes a lot of faith. In fact, I believe in many ways it takes more faith than believing in Christ Jesus. Because you have to have faith that, that certain authors that you've read who claim inside knowledge of the cosmos, you have to have faith in them that, that what they're saying is true. You know, it, it's like imagine an ant. You know, our, our house, for some reason, recently has, uh, has, you know, started having all these ants come in. I don't know where they're coming from, but every night, like, I'll, I'll see ants. I'm sitting on the couch, and I feel something tickling my leg, and there's like an ant crawling on my leg. There's ants there. Now, now these ants are in my house, but as far as I can tell, that ant has no recollection of who I am or where it is. It has no understanding uh, that, that there's humans that are living there and that it is invading my house. It has no idea of what is going on there. So the ant could be saying, I don't believe that Judah exists. And that's okay. It can deny that. It can have all the faith in that that it wants to. But that does not negate the fact that I do exist and that I am there. Just as an ant can't fully comprehend me, how can we fully comprehend things that we don't know. And yet, to, to, to go and say that there is no God, we have to have faith in some author who told me that there isn't a God. So I'm trusting you that you somehow know. Some say, I believe in science, not in the Bible. I believe in science as if somehow they contradict. Like, like, like I mean, we're talking about God who created physics, who created the world. Science and the Bible do not contradict. Actually, what you're saying, though, is that you have faith in certain voices. That you have faith and people who interpret science in a particular way that, that, that pleases the agenda of our life. We, we trust that what they're saying is true. You're, you're saying that, that you have faith, you're, you're trusting a person's opinion about the afterlife or the lack thereof of an afterlife who has never actually even been there before. Think about that for a moment. We say, well, there's these people and they say there is no life after death. Well, how do they know? How do they know? How can they be so sure? And yet we trust them. We have faith in them. So, so whatever your belief system is right now, I'm not here to put, put down your belief system. I'm not here to, to, to discredit it other than to say simply that whatever it is that you believe, you are believing in something. There is no lack of faith. You believe in something. At the very least, we believe in and. And our automobiles, right? We believe in them and that we get in our car, we're going to crank it up and it's going to go, even though maybe we don't understand all the intricacies of it. We believe in, in, in the, the, the power of aviation. We get onto an airplane, we fly across the country, even though we may not understand what keeps the plane in the air. Do we have faith that there will be no consequences for our actions? Well, I just don't believe that anything's going to come of all this. I have faith that, that there's no consequences for my actions. Actions based on what logic, though? Based on like, like what logic are we basing that faith on? Is it just based on your own opinion? Why well, I came up with this idea and I'm having the faith in my own idea, as if somehow my idea is all knowing. See, for thousands of years, we thought that the sun revolved around us, and people were saying, Well, I have faith that the sun revolves around us, but they didn't have the right information until we were able to discover the fact that actually we are rotating around the sun instead. So you can believe whatever you want, and it doesn't really change the reality of the situation. But we all have faith in something. As it says in Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. 
And, and this, is, this is not only considering our, our faith in Jesus Christ, because it's certainly considering that, but everything in life. We live by, by faith and not by sight alone. We can't understand everything there is to understand, so we live by, by faith. So where are you putting your faith today? Where are you putting your faith? Are you putting your faith maybe in a specific author? Say, well, whenever this person writes something, I, I believe that what they're saying is true. Do you put your faith in the media? So many people I see putting their faith in the media. And, and it's like, well, this, this you know, channel said this, and this news media outlet said this. And, and they put their faith in the media. Do, do you put your faith in a, in a college professor who seems so wise, who seems like they have inside knowledge of the cosmos, of the universe, of the going-ons, of the afterlife. So I'm going to have my faith in a professor. Or do we have our faith in God, a God who truly is all-knowing? Do we have faith in the gospel of what God's word says and that it is true? This is why we have around our, uh, our waist, we have the belt of truth because everything hangs on truth. Do we put our faith in, in the gospel which has stood the test of time? See, the shield that we're talking about today which says the, the, the shield of faith, this is not an arbitrary faith. This is specifically speaking about faith in God. Faith in Jesus Christ. This is not just a, a faith in, in some author, not faith in the cosmos, not, not even faith in a higher power. This is speaking about faith in God, specifically faith in Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So why do we have faith? Why is it important for us to have faith? Because in your notes, faith in God will protect you from the attacks of the enemy. You're going to be attacked. I'm going to be attacked. Perhaps you've had attacks this week. Maybe you're going to have an attack later on today. Maybe you're going to have an attack this coming week. Our faith in God will provide protection from the attacks. From, from the deadly darts, it says, from these fiery darts, these deadly darts, the, the dart of depression and the dart of doubt and the dart of discouragement and the dart of distress and the dart of, of disappointment. These darts that come flying at us to disable us, to cripple us, to distract us, to discourage us. Because in your notes, the devil will do whatever he can to distract you, to keep you from advancing. See, see the, these fiery darts that would even come at the Roman soldiers, oftentimes, it wouldn't be fatal to the soldiers. But, but what it would do is, is this flaming arrow would come and, and hit Charlie in the arm. And, and then Charlie's on fire. And we got to go put out Charlie. So they're over there, and they're trying to put out Charlie. Meanwhile, you know, Sam over here, he's got one in the leg. So we're putting out that fire. It's, it's, not, it's not killing anybody necessarily, but it's distracting the army. They're going around putting out fires. And maybe you feel like you've been putting out some fires lately. It, it's keeping you from advancing. So you know what the Roman soldiers would do? See, their shields were made out of uh, one of the very first innovations of, uh, or, or variations of plywood. It was made out of plywood, and it would be covered with leather, and the edges would be bound in metal with a metal center. And they would take these shields before going into battle, and they would soak them in the water. So that way, when they were marching against the enemy, and fiery arrows would come at them, it would hit the arrow, and it would extinguish it. So they weren't being distracted by putting out fires. It would extinguish it, and they could continue moving forward. See, sometimes the things that come at us are these small things. We feel like we're being, being hit from all sides. We're putting out all these fires. We're getting hit all around. And it may not be the big things that take you out. It may not be the job loss. It may not be, you know, the relationship problem. It may not be the failed grade that takes you out. Sometimes it's the small things. It's the small things that come at us. The discouragement, the doubt, the distress, the depression. The small things that come, these small little fiery darts. It's the small things. It's like, did you know what the most deadly animal in the world is? The most deadly animal in the world. I mean, we can think lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Or, or, or sharks or, or, or sharknadoes or elephants or hippos. I don't know. What's the most deadly animal in the world? It's the mosquito. The mosquito kills on average one million people each and every year. Something so small. You would think it would be the, 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 the king of the jungle, the lion, surely. No. It's a small mosquito is the most deadly thing. It's these small things that are coming at us. 
They distract us. They get us off course. And there's an enemy on the prowl looking for who he can devour. So when these fiery darts come at us, the shield of faith extinguishes the darts so that we can put out the fires and take a step forward. It says in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, and in this time, Jesus is preaching to a great group of people, but, but it's just getting really crowded, and, and, and he's having a hard time seeing everybody. They're having a hard time hearing him. They're just crowding, and, and Jesus sees a couple boats. And he says to the guy, hey, Simon, uh, Peter, can I borrow your boat? Can we just push out a little bit so I can get away from the crowd? They can hear me. They can all see me a little bit better. So he gets in the boat, and, and they're out there, and Jesus is preaching to everybody, and he's in the boat, and he's preaching to them, they're having a good time. And, and then after that, the crowd leaves, and Jesus says, hey, Peter, you want to go fishing? Let's go fishing, Peter. Now, Peter's a professional fisherman. P Peter spent all night fishing. Jesus said, Let, let's go fishing, Simon. Look what it says in verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard, hard all night and haven't caught anything. I don't know if you've ever went fishing and never caught anything. I have several, several times. In fact, I'm better at not catching fish than catching fish. Like, like I have thousands of dollars of fishing gear, and, and let me tell you, I'm a master of not catching fish. You can bring me somewhere, and I can guarantee you that, that I can probably go anywhere you take me, and I can not catch fish there, okay? But, but, but Peter, these guys are professional fishermen, and they didn't catch anything the night before. This is their livelihood. They're probably living paycheck to paycheck. That whole night was a waste, and he's like, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but if you say so. I'll let down the nets again. But if you say so. So they went out and they cast out the nets again. Maybe you've heard the story. And fish started filling those nets. Started filling those nets. And Peter said, oh, we can't even bring the, the net in. There's so many fish in there. Another boat came along and started to help them. And they're bringing the fish in. And scripture says that both of the boats began to sink because of the amount of fish that they caught. But these words here that that Peter said can, can change your life. What did he say? But because you say so. Peter said, I'm the professional here. I'm the professional fisherman, Jesus. But because you say so. See, he's picking up his shield of faith. Because you say so, Jesus. I, I don't entirely agree with you. I'm not sure this is the best strategy, Jesus. But because you say so, I'll cast the nets out again. See, in your notes, faith isn't faith until you step out. Until you step out. Step out of the boat, step out of the water, until you take that step of faith. See, faith isn't faith until it has action associated with it. But yet we try to rationalize ourselves out of obedience. I, I believe that God wants me to do something or avoid something, but I begin to rationalize myself, saying, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should really be generous. I mean, I mean, God says to be generous, but, but you know, I, I, I'm having a hard enough time, and I need to, to plan and prepare. So, so I don't really think I can be generous to this person. I don't think I can, can contribute to the kingdom of God. I don't think I can serve in church. I, I don't think I can love my enemy. That's just too much to ask. When, when Jesus said to love his enemy... <clears throat> He wasn't thinking about my neighbor. He wasn't thinking about my spouse. He wasn't thinking about my, my ex. He wasn't thinking about my boss. He was thinking about somebody else. So it's okay. I can rationalize myself out of obedience, and we think about it too long. Say, well, I just got to make sure all the, the dots connect. But see, faith is only faith when the dots don't connect. You ever do the, the connect the dots? And like, oh, oh, I can kind of see what it's going to look like at the end. But some of those connect the dots, you look at it like, I have no clue what it's going to be. I just got to go from one to two. And two to three, and three to four, and four to five. And can it continue to connect the dots until the picture becomes apparent. But I'm trusting by faith that the artist that drew the picture out knows that there is going to be a finished product in the end. I'm going to take a step of faith, trusting that God will connect the dots, and it's not up to me to do so. Because you say so, Jesus, I will do it. Because your word says so, I will do it. In James chapter 2, verse 14. He says, what good is it to your brothers and sisters if you say you have faith, but you don't show it with your actions? What good is it if you say that you have faith, but you don't love your neighbor? What good is it if you say that you have faith, but, but you won't help somebody in need? Well, what good is it if you say that you have faith, but, but you hate somebody? You use angry words towards them. 
You judge them, you criticize them. He says, can that kind of faith save anyone? That's not the shield of faith at all. That, that kind of faith can't save anybody. That's not faith in Jesus Christ. See, faith in Jesus Christ is an active faith. It's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this up and I'm gonna carry it with me. And somebody make, my, my, might make fun of me. Say, well, why are you carrying that shield around? You know, oh, you're just hiding behind your faith. That's right, I am hiding behind my faith. I'm gonna hide behind it. I'm gonna hide behind it because it's gonna protect me from the attacks of the enemy. From the fiery darts of depression and doubt and anxiety and worry and fear that are going to come at me. See, what good is it if you have a shield but you decide you're not going to use it? Oh, I have my faith, but I'm going to keep it separate from my real life. I'm going to go to work every day. I'm going to go to school every day. I'm going to live my life, my relationships every day. But on Sunday, I'll come and I'll, and I'll, I'll pick up my faith on Sunday mornings and then I'll put it back down again. Never to be seen again until the next week. If we have a shield, the purpose of having a shield is so that we can use it. Because the final thing in your notes is that faith that is inactive is worthless. Faith that is inactive is worthless. See, Peter had to take action on what Jesus said. Think about that story we just talked about. Jesus says, Peter, bring the boat out of the water. You know, Jesus could have made the fish jump in the boat. Like, like, like Jesus didn't even need Peter to throw the net in the water. Right? Think about it. Like, like here's the creator of all the universe. He didn't need Peter to throw. He could have said, Peter, let's go out on the water for a little bit. Let's just cruise around. And, and fish jumping in the boat, jumping in the boat, jumping in the boat. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. Peter had to act on it, even though it didn't make sense. Even though Peter knew my net is, is big. The ropes are thick. The fish can see the ropes in the broad daylight. There's no way you're going to catch fish in the broad daylight with a net such as this. This net is designed for nighttime fishing only. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. But because you said so, I'm going to step out and I will do what you tell me to do. And he went out there and he took action and God brought in the fish. But Peter had to take a step. It didn't make sense. And both boats were on the verge of sinking, but he said, because you said so, I will do it. Several years ago, I went on, I think at Lake Compounds, or an amusement park. It's a sky coaster. You know, it's the thing that, like, you're dangling from a cable, and it pulls you way up, and then you pull the ripcord, and you swing down. And you're like, you're flying. And it seems all great until you're 180 foot up at the top of the thing looking down. And you're like, I don't know if this cable is strong enough to hold me. Like, like th those poles, they looked really big when I was down there. But up here, those poles hold, like they don't look so big anymore. This cable doesn't seem so safe anymore. And in my mind, I'm saying, somebody who's a lot smarter than me, who probably has an engineering degree, figured out the tensile strength of this cable. They figured out the structural integrity of all these poles and know that this is more than strong enough, more than adequate to hold my weight. So I had to have faith in something I didn't fully understand. I've taught a lot of people how to repel. And that's the hardest part is getting over the edge of the cliff. And even myself, I look at the rope, I own a rope. I don't know how it was made. I don't understand how all the fibers work together, but I know that I have to have faith in something I don't fully understand. And as I go over the edge of the cliff and I begin to go down the rock face, I trust that somebody understands it. See, the faith that we're talking about today is not a faith in your job. This is not faith in politics or a politician or a particular political party. This is not faith in your education, not faith in money, fame, popularity, not faith in anything other than I'm going to have the shield of faith, the faith based on Jesus Christ, my Lord, based on the truth of his word. We'll close with this verse in Psalms 18, verse 1. It says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength, and the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection, and he is my shield. He's the power that saves me in my place of safety. And I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Maybe you're facing some enemies today. 
And God is saying, take up my shield. Take up the shield of faith. Maybe you said you didn't have faith. Maybe you had faith and it was a misplaced faith. Faith in something else. Faith in in something other than the truth of God's word. Jesus is saying to us today, pick up the shield of faith. See, we can have faith. Why? Because we serve a God who is faithful. I have faith in a God who is faithful. I have faith in a God who is my strong fortress. I have faith in a God who is my safety. He is our protector, and we can put our trust in him. We can put our faith in him. And even in times of difficulty, even in times of hardship, God is your shield. He is your fortress. He is your ever-present help in time of need. And we can put our faith in him because he's faithful, and he's strong, and he's the rock on which I stand and he is my hiding place and in him alone I will put my faith so we can lift up this shield the shield of faith which will protect us from the darts of the enemy and say I will put my faith in Jesus Christ my Lord Father we come to you now and we thank you we thank you that you are faithful even when we're not so faithful ourselves you are faithful you are the firm foundation on which we can stand. Today, wherever you are, whatever your situation, whatever you're going through, whatever attack you may be facing, God is inviting you into a life of faith in him. We walk by faith and not by sight. He's saying, why don't you put your faith in me? You've been putting your faith in a lot of other things but it's not been protecting you. It's not been protecting you from the fiery darts. It's time to put your faith in me. Anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Won't you call in his name now and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Father, we decide today to put our faith in you. We lift up the shield of faith. We hold this high. We use this as our protection Where else could we go for protection other than you? So we come to you, we put our faith in you, we put our trust in you, we put our hope in you, and we know that you will continue the work that you are doing in us. So we trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.